Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to give us a few minutes to allow some of our participants to, to log into the event. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to this very critical session on the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation at 21 Years, Assessing Preparedness for Win-Win Sino-Africa Multilateral and Bilateral Collaborations. I would like to thank our distinguished opening speakers and our honorable panelists and chairpersons and all of you, our special attendees for making today's webinar possible. I also want to acknowledge our partners from the afro sino Center for International Relations and the African Union Development Agency, New Partnership for African Development, who invited us to collaborate on this important subject of FOCAC and African agency at 21 years. Suffice to say, there has been immense activity over the past 21 years, such as the FOCAC measures and action plans, which cannot all be addressed fully today. In fact, we plan to continue this discussion by addressing various subjects related to FOCAC, such as infrastructure, agriculture, people to people, etc. It's a fact that FOCAC has been an important platform to assess the broader trends of the Sino-African partnership over the years and into the future. Globally, we have seen that other countries like the United States try and emulate the FOCAC model through their U.S.-Africa summits, which have been very inconsistent as the last U.S.-Africa summit was held in 2014. FOCAC, on the other hand, has been consistent as evidenced with the upcoming 21st FOCAC Summit, which, which will be held this November in Senegal, despite the current COVID-19 pandemic. There is no question that the FOCAC measures and action plans have been very critical for regional growth. China's infrastructure footprint on the continent is undebatable, and China has displaced the United States as Africa's largest trade partner, with total trade topping 200 billion in 2020. But the question is, has the continent really leveraged on FOCAC at the level that it should? Some scholars have raised issues of continental preparedness and agency, including the issue of African capacity in regards to sustainability of FOCAC in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, to unpack the subject matter, permit me to introduce you to our first panel. However, before I introduce you to the speakers, may I also remind the audience that per the program, the question answer period will be at the end of this session. However, I invite all of you to take advantage of the chat box to ask questions during the session, which will be attended to during the discussion period. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome our first uh, speaker, 
Mr. Martin Boilan, who is the Acting Director for Knowledge Ma Management and Program Evaluation at the African Union Development Agency, New Partnership for African Development. Thank you. Thank you <coughs> so, so much, and thank you for the introduction. I hope you can hear me, all of you. Uh, very, very delighted to be with you this morning. Let me start by recognizing, can I confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, let me start by recognizing, uh, indeed, everybody, as everybody is important, but let me mention Your Excellency uh, Yun Yang, Minister Councillor for the Embass of the Republic of China in Pretoria, recognizing the various uh, distinguished diplomatic representatives present uh, and connecting to this webinar, dear members of the African Union Development Agency uh, programs uh, and staff that are actually participating, uh, as well as the uh, representatives from the various partner institutions uh, that uh, I will not go through in terms of listing, there are many, and indeed the participants uh, present in this webinar, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And let me also emphasize that it's our uh, mode that platforms of this kind is not our intention to preach to you, is uh, our intention that we're having conversation and therefore even as much as we are making these statements and presenting you will notice that the webinar is arranged to encourage dialogue to encourage conversation through the panels and uh, as our moderator has just mentioned please use all facilities available including the, uh, the chat box to dialogue to have conversation with everybody including ourselves in this platform. Let me state uh, that the African Development Agency is delighted to welcome you in this virtual meeting to allow you once again uh, this very intensive moment for useful exchange motivated by our shared aspirations for sustainable and inclusive people-centered development uh, on one hand, evidence and facts on the other. Today's webinar could, take, could have not taken place without the visionary support and leadership of our CEO, Dr. Ibrahim Mayaki, who would have liked definitely to be with us here, but uh, conflicted in terms of uh, other engagements in the, in the same time slot. And therefore, I take this opportunity to convey his greetings and good wishes and productive discussions in this webinar this morning. Based on the institutional mission uh, of the AUDA through its knowledge management and program evaluation directorate, would like uh, and uh, uh, actually very delighted working with the various partners that you uh, will get to know and are present here. Actually delighted that we can have this platform to foster the development of the continental uh, development agenda by catalyzing and leveraging partnerships. And ultimately, intention is to argument implementation of Agenda 23, which is actually at the center of the continent's uh, development uh, ambitions. AUDA, African Union Development Agency, is a people's agency is a people's organization. It belongs to the African citizen and the, the member states. And therefore, at its core responsibility is to accompany the continent in addressing societal challenges towards transformative impact on Africa's aspirations and goals for sustainable growth and inclusive development. And here we have a clear challenge as a continent. We can't just continue to do things. We need to be demonstrating results. We need to be demonstrating impact. And it goes from how we actually are identifying our resources, allocating the resources in those high impact areas. And indeed that everybody on the street in the populations is, is able to feel the consequences 
positively of uh, those development efforts. And therefore, this is where science, this is where evidence, this is where think tanks come into play in terms of contributing to public effort, public uh, 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 and private efforts on those development efforts. People's happiness can, can only come, uh, become a reality through our collective people-driven efforts based on providing knowledge-based advisory services and technical assistance to AU member states and economic, uh, regional economic communities who are actually key part of our partners to strengthen both planning and execution capacities across the various levels within the country, region and continent, across sectors and the governments. By providing for the continent's technical interface for integrated and coordinated work between especially African players, stakeholders, and our partners, including private sector, both domestic and international, and it's in this context that you actually see the value of uh, uh, our collaboration with China and uh, expect that as we go forward, the moderator mentioned other uh, countries and the continents we are collaborating with, but I'm sure we do appreciate the value of Africa's engagement with China and that we can go to an even higher level in that mutual responsibility. The result should impact both ways. Uh, and we know actually that the work to realize mutual results uh, has to happen both on Africa side and on China side. And we can raise this platform as just more than a discussion platform, but directly impacting on our shared responsibility for a prosperous uh, world, especially China, Africa. And therefore, today's topic uh, 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 and the question is very, very critical uh, and supports the whole conversation and the participation of our private sector, of our civil society in argumenting the efforts between Africa and China and indeed providing not just a global effort, but a shared responsibility as the citizens of the world towards the uh, uh, safe and the active world with everybody having access to the minimum they need in terms of uh, a prosperous livelihood. Finally, the moderator, let me conclude by uh, uh, let, let, let me acknowledge the value, as you mentioned, of FOCAC uh, and the justification of FOCAC uh, in terms of uh, collaboration between AUD, uh, African Union, and China. The deal between our two uh, partnerships uh, was materialized through the first ministerial conference in Beijing in 2000 to overcome the challenges of economic globalization in promoting a shared agenda. And this is a vision, this is a rationale that is just as true today as it was then and we hope that this webinar is going to not just reinforce that, but pick up very practical avenues that can allow us to realize the value of this collaboration. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pwala, for your excellent opening remarks, um, which pretty much summarized the continental perspective uh, which represents us as uh, as all uh, member states and citizens of this region. And you have uh, put everything in perspective for us and what it means for having FOCAC um, with, um, to collaborate with us and including with the African Union. Um, so on that note, I would like to now um, bring in our next speaker. But before our next speaker comes on, I would like to... Um, also confirm with our IT people to please let in our special guest, His Excellency Minister Councillor Yu, because they are struggling to come in as panelists. They are still sending me messages. So if they can please sort that out now. Thank you very much. At this point, we will have our next speaker, uh, Dr. David Munai, who is the co-director of the China Africa Center 
at the University of Johannesburg. And he is an international relations and foreign policy expert who holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Witzwaterland. And that's what, and um, you can see his bio there, the shortened version. And so at this stage, I'll ask uh, Dr. Munai to please come on and uh, take over to set the scene for today's event. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, um, the embassy, uh, the AU, AUD, DA, uh, as well as um, all fellow uh, panelists. It has been 21 years since the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation conveyed for the first time in, in the year 2000. The forum will convey again this year, 2021, for the eighth time. The forum was established to institutionalize China-Africa relation for better and more comprehensive cooperation between the two parties. It has become a significant event in the international calendar. The relation between Africa and China has vastly improved and a lot has been achieved under the auspice of FOCAC. What has been achieved? The trade between the two parties grew from US 10 billion in the year 2000 to a peak of 208 billion uh, in the year 2019. China has also become a major source of development finance for countries providing a total of US 150 billion in credit lines between 2005 and the year 2020. In the same period, China's foreign direct investment, FDI, stock has accumulated a value of US dollars 345 billion. The value of Chinese businesses in Africa amounts to a staggering 2 trillion US dollars. 46 African countries are now part of a China's flagship Belt and Road Initiative, which has seen huge and impactful infrastructure projects being rolled out across the continent. China has become the largest bilateral source of infrastructure investment in Africa. Besides economics, people-to-people -people relation has improved immensely. China is now the second biggest host of African overseas university students with over 80,000 Africans getting educated in China. An estimated um, a million Chinese citizens uh, and now resides in Africa, while China hosts an estimated half a million African citizens. China and Africa have supported each other on multilateral platforms on important global issues, ranging from climate change, technology, and health, Important as it is, China also has donated the African Union headquarters as well as the Africa Center for Disease Prevention and Control, a sign of strong diplomatic relation. China is in, now an observer member of the AU, while the AU also has diplomatic representation in Beijing. The two parties work together in peace and security and contributing a significant number of troops on UN peacekeeping missions in Africa. Tracking the pandemic currently holds the pride of place as a top priority in the Sino-African Association. China has donated tons of anti-pandemic -pand material, including face masks, personal protective equipment, and diagnostic tools to numerous African countries. Africa has also taken delivery of over 77 million vaccines from Beijing, both through purchases and donations. Africa has offered diplomatic support to China in face of criticism of Western countries over its handling of the coronavirus. In the infrastructure arena, it remains the key Africa's advancement, especially in the context of new African continental free trade area. In such, as such, the infrastructure cooperation should remain 
a key part of the Sino-African relation. Fighting the pandemic also remains an important issue, especially access to vaccines. Investment in health infrastructure is critical. Investment in digital technology, some of these new issues um, affecting the global arena. Working together in fighting climate change are other areas where the two parties are working closely. In closure, I'd like to wish everyone um, participating in this forum, I wish you all the best and looking forward in answering number of outstanding questions as we move into a new era. I thank you, Chen. Thank you very much, Dr. Munai, for your for setting the stage for us on today's discussion on FOCAC uh, at 21 years, a, quite a milestone indeed, which you have summarized in your speech. At this point, I will ask His Excellency Minister Councillor Yu Yong of the Embassy of the People's Republic of China in Pretoria. Uh, Mr. Yu Yong joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the People's Republic of China in 1996. He started his career at the Department of African Affairs of Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he dealt with bilateral affairs between China and Southern and Eastern African countries, as well as FUCAC. Um, and he also has served as the director for the political section of the Embassy for the Republic of China in the, in the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And he has served as director for bilateral affairs between China and Southern African countries and SADC and the Department of Foreign of African Affairs at MFA, of, F, of MFA, sorry. Starting from 2015, Councillor, Minister Councillor Yu was the councillor, and he's now the Minister Councillor in the Embassy of the People's Republic to the Republic of South Africa, in charge of bilateral, multilateral, consular, and administrative affairs. Uh, Minister Councillor Yu Yong, I trust that you are now with us. I would like to apologize for the delays that you, the struggle that you had with logging in. And um, I was pleasantly surprised to know that you are still with us here in South Africa. And I'm really glad to know <laughs> that you are. And so we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Uh, Honorable Dr. Yatsin April, uh, my old friend, <laughs> uh, coordinator BRICS Research Center, Human Science Research Council. Honorable Mr. Martin Buana, Acting Director, Knowledge Management and Program Evaluation, African Union Development Agency. Honorable Dr. David Moyai, China Africa Center, University of Johannesburg. Honorable Dr. Jackie Sinias, Chair of the Board, Head African Futures and Innovation Institute for Security Studies, scholars and friends, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great pleasure to join today's virtual seminar, which is jointly organized by BRICS Research Center of HSRC, African Union Development Agency, and Afro Center of International Relations. Please allow me extend on behalf of the Chinese embassy in South Africa. My sincere gratitude to the organizers of the seminar and to the scholars and the friends who care and support the development of China, South Africa and China-African relations. The theme of today's seminar focuses on FOCAC, which is of great significance. The eighth the Federal Conference of FOCAC will be held in Senegal at the end of this year. This seminar will help the Chinese side better understand and hear valuable views and suggestions of our African friends on the new session of FOCAC in order to make positive contributions to its success. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, FOCAC has gone through 21 years of history, delivering a leap in China-Africa relations from a new type of partnership to a new type of strategic partnership and to a comprehensive strategic and cooperative partnership, 
I myself have very close ties with FORCAC. By participating in the preparation for three summits and the five ministerial conference, I'm very glad to take this opportunity to briefly review the significant achievements of China-Africa cooperation since the establishing of the FORCAC. Over the past 21 years, China-Africa political trust has become stronger. We have established a multi-level and multi-layered dialogue mechanism for FORCAC and has held three summits and seven ministerial conferences so far. At the 2018 FORCAC Beijing Summit, Chinese President Xi Jinping put forward the proposition of building a stronger China-African community with a shared future, which was highly appreciated and actively supported by African leaders. Last year, at the critical moment in the global fight against the COVID-19, leaders from both China and Africa gathered together in an extraordinary China-African summit and committed to building a China-African community of health. His Excellency Mr. Wang Yi, Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister, successfully visited five African countries, including Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo, continuing the tradition of Chinese Foreign Minister's first annual visit to Africa for 31 consecutive years. It has been proven that China-Africa political trust has this stood the test of international landscape changes and the brotherhood of China-Africa solidarity and friendship has become deeper and deeper. Over the past 21 years, China-Africa practical cooperation has witnessed fruitful results. As my friend, uh, Dr. David just has mentioned, under the framework of FORCAC, China-Africa economic and trade cooperation has entered a new stage of transformation and upgrading, defined by a shift from government-led assistance to market-driven trade and enterprise investment, from general merchandise trade to production capacity cooperation and processing trade, and from project contracting to investment, construction, operation, and financial cooperation. China remains Africa's largest trading partner for 11 consecutive years and is one of the main sources of investment in Africa, contributing more than 20% to Africa's economic growth for many years in a row. Even with the COVID-19, China-Africa economic and trade cooperation has backed the trend and delivered a bright answer. According to the Chinese statistics from January to September this year, China-Africa trade volume reached 185.2 billion US dollars, up 38.2% year on year. In 2020, China's direct investment in Africa reached 2.96 billion US dollars, with new investment covering 47 African countries. In 19 countries, investment increased by more than 10%. China has signed Belt and Road Initiative cooperation agreement with AU and 46 African countries, and has built a number of major infrastructure projects, which has brought significant changes to African economic and social development. It has been proved that China-Africa programmatic cooperation has brought more benefits to both countries and uh, both people and the bond of interest for common development in China Africa has become stronger and stronger. Over the past 21 years, culture and people to people exchanges between China and Africa has been unprecedentedly active. Under the framework of the full CAC, important mechanisms and platforms for people to people exchanges has been established one after another, such as the China Africa Youth Festival, the Think Tech Forum, the Media Cooperation Forum, the Youth Leaders Forum, and the non governmental Forum. Cooperation between China and Africa in the fields of culture, education, and journalism has blossomed in an all around way. And the China Africa Research Institute has been established. Exchanges among youth, women, non governmental organizations, and academic institutions have become increasingly frequent. 
China has provided a total of about 120,000 government scholarships to African countries, built 61, 61 Confucius Institutes and 44 Confucius classrooms jointly with 46 African countries, sent 21,000 members of medical team to 48 African countries, and treated about 220 million African patients. China and Africa had established 150 pairs of sister city relationship. Facts has proven that people-to-people -people exchanges between China and Africa has effectively promoted mutual understanding and the cultural co-prosperity between Chinese and African peoples. And the long-standing friendship between two sides has been continuously sublimated. Over the past 21 years, China and Africa has supported each other formally and forcefully. China and Africa support each other on issues involving each other's core interests and major concerns. China opposes in the first interference in the inner in affairs of African countries and the frequent use of unilateral sanctions by some major powers. Security cooperation between China and Africa has deepened, and China is a staunch force in safeguarding peace in Africa. China and Africa join hands to defend multilateralism, oppose unilateralism and protectionism, jointly safeguard the basic norms of international relations and international fairness, as well as justice, and safeguard the legitimate development rights of developing countries. In the battle against the COVID-19, China and Africa help each other and overcome difficulties together. Jointly, China and Africa launched an initiative on the Partnership for Africa's Development. Facts have proved that with the formal support between China and Africa, the route of development and the revitalization between the two sides will become increasingly wider. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, enhancing friendly ties and cooperation with Africa has been a consistent choice of China's diplomacy. According to African friends, FOCAC is a cooperation mechanism that truly delivers. The reason lies in its consistent adherence to the following guiding principles. Firstly, top-level designs and concept guidance. In March 2013, President Xi Jinping chose Africa as the de destination of his first overseas tour after taking office. Up to now, he has visited African, uh, Africa continent four times, chaired the FOCA summit twice, proposed the 10 cooperation plans and eight major initiatives successfully practice the principle of ordering seniority, real results, amity, and good faith, and that of pursuing the great good and the shared interests among countries, charting the course for the future development of bilateral relations. With a similar fate in the past and a common vision, China and Africa have extended sympathy to each other and helped each other throughout all the years. Together, we have embarked on a distinctive Path of win win cooperation. Secondly, mutual respect, equality, and mutual benefit. From the very beginning, we have always taken China Africa relations as part of South South cooperation and always beneath the FOCAC, composed of China and 53 African countries and AU. It's by no means one versus 54, but 54 plus one. The voice of every country shall be heard and respected. During the preparation and holding of FOCAC meetings, African countries are encouraged to fully express their views and engage in extensive discussions and consultations on China-Africa cooperation. China will be a good friend, partner, and brother of Africa forever. Thirdly, action-oriented, pragmatic, and efficient. The Chinese side never leaves any of its initiatives to visions or on paper. Only by putting them into practice in a planned manner. Every three years, FOCAC rolled out a package action plan. The 2018 Beijing summit alone produced more than 880 deliverables. We refuse to make empty promises. 
FOCAC has established an effective follow-up mechanism, which provides an important guarantee for police implementation, project execution, and output. Fourthly, embracing openness and inclusiveness. FOCAC serves as a fine example of marginalism rather than a closed-door or exclusive mechanism. The Chinese side believes openness is vital in cooperation with Africa. It is important for major powers to share experience and learn from each other so that Africa's peace and development can benefit from the common effort and the contribution of the international community. Africa must never again be an arena for major power rivalry. Africa's cooperation with China has improved its development capacity and the business environment which in turn has created favorable conditions for other countries' cooperation with the continent. China has taken part in more African-related trilateral and multilateral cooperation in recent years. We commend and encourage such cooperation and will continue to support it. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the COVID-19 is a pressing challenge facing the international community as well as China and Africa. However, the pandemic will eventually end, and China Africa cooperation enjoys even broader prospect and a brighter future. China is ready to work with Africa to carry forward the focus spirit of consultation, contribution, and shared benefits. Enhance focus as a golden brand and plan and upgrade China Africa cooperation at a faster pace. I would like to share with you some of my thoughts on deepening. China Africa cooperation in the post COVID 19 era. First, China will actively help Africa enhance capacity building in seven arenas, areas. The pandemic has severely impacted the economic and social development of the African continent, highlighting the weakness and inadequacy of Africa's capacity for independent development. During his visit to Africa in January this year, Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi put forward a seven-point vision for upgrading China-Africa cooperation, namely joining hands in building a healthy, collected, digital, green, and a secure Africa. This is a strategic vision put forward by China in light of the new situation, new needs, and new opportunities in China-Africa cooperation and with a view to build an even closer China-Africa community with a shared future. China will make great efforts to help Africa on major disease prevention. We will step up industrial capacity cooperation with Africa, promote clustering and synergy of cooperation projects, and make them more advanced in industrial cooperation and more locally based. And we are prepared to help Africa enhance its homegrown production capacity. We will explore China-Africa free trade cooperation and help Africa increase its infrastructure, trade and financial collectivity. We will step up agriculture cooperation with Africa, including on food production, storage, and transportation, and help Africa to enhance its food security. We will leverage China's technological strengths and help Africa seize the opportunity of ICT. We will implement the concept of sustainable development and help Africa on climate change response. We will promote political settlement of hotspot issues in Africa and help Africa enhance peacekeeping and counterterrorism capacity. Second, seize the opportunity of the fourth industrial revolution and add new wings to China-Africa cooperation. The fourth industrial revolution is a new opportunity to upgrade China-Africa cooperation in the post-COVID-19 era. Africa is now actively participating in the fourth industrial revolution. Actions speak louder than words. China has become a major contributor to the infrastructure development of Africa's information and the communication industry. With about 80% of Africa's bankable network infrastructure financed by Chinese companies. The cooperation between China and Africa on the fourth industrial revolution has great potential. China is the most reliable partner that African countries, including South Africa, can choose. China is ready to expand cooperation with Africa on new infrastructure such as 5G, big data 
sentence and artificial intelligence, as well as new forms of business, such as digital economy, smart cities, cleaning energy, and e-commerce. Not long ago, China announced that it would work with African countries to formulate and implement the plan for China-Africa Digital Innovation Partnership, which is a new measure for China-Africa practical cooperation. We believe it will force the new growth drivers for the economic and the social development of African countries and provide new opportunities for expanding China-Africa practical cooperation. Third, we should dovetail cooperation platforms to further unleash the development potential of the African continent. The FOCAC is a model for South-South cooperation and the BRICS mechanism is an important platform for cooperation among emerging markets. We can fully lap the potential of the FOCAC and BRICS cooperation mechanism by effectively synergizing them. China has been actively advocating the BRICS plus cooperation concept and model. In the 2013 and 2018, the BRICS summits were held in South Africa. South Africa has inherited the BRICS plus cooperation model proposed by China, which has strongly promoted the in-depth cooperation between Africa and BRICS countries. Africa is home to the largest number of developing countries in the world. Only through close communication and consultation with Africa can BRICS truly reflect the voice of the developing countries on the international stage. BRICS represents the interests and serve as a bridge linking developing and developed countries. We shall force a pattern of international development cooperation with North-South cooperation as the main channel and South-South cooperation as another, so as to make the international order more just and equal equitable. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the FOCAC is a precious asset for both China and Africa. China Africa cooperation and FOCAC building will never stop. We need to advance with the times, promote high quality development of China Africa cooperation and open up an even bright future for China African relations. I look forward to your insights for the institutional building of FOCAC and upgrading of China Africa cooperation. I wish this seminar a great success. I thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Councillor Yu. I think it's time that we give you a full-time citizenship here just to stay here with us in South Africa. You might as well. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, which has really given us, what I like about it is that you even talk about the future post the pandemic, um, including the, the seven point vision plan that was presented by the foreign minister of China. Um, which is a very critical plan, which is inclusive of various sectors such as um, uh, ICT, peacekeeping, seizing the fourth industrial revolution. And we can keep going on and unpacking. Um, but we want to thank you for, for at least setting the stage as to what we should look forward to um, post uh, FOCAC 2021. At this point, I would like to now bring in... Uh, Dr. Yaki Silias. I have to say, Dr. Silias, out of all the bios that I got, yours was the shortest uh, bio, which I know is, I told Pamela, that's impossible given all the work that I know that you have done out there. I should have gotten at least a page full of, of all your work. But anyway, to summarize quickly, uh, Dr. Silias is chair of the board and head of the African Futures Innovation Institute and Innovation at the Institute for Security Studies. And he currently serves as chairman of the ISS Board of Trustees. And he's also the head of African Futures and Innovation Program at ISS. And he has a 2017 bestseller amongst many other publications he has done, of course. And this one is called uh, Fate of the Nation, which addresses South Africa's future political, economic, and social perspectives. And his most recent book is on the future of Africa, challenges and opportunities. 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, without further um, ado, may I please bring our keynote speaker on the floor, the Honorable uh, Dr. Yaki Silias. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Yasina, and it's good to see you. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thanks to all the partners and the speakers that have gone uh, ahead of me um, and to the NEPAD AUDA agency for organizing this. I'm going to share a screen and show a few graphs. Uh, the presentation will be available uh, afterwards, so um, there are going to be a few numbers and graphs, but uh, I will share the presentation. Um, so um, uh, the organizers asked me to speak a little bit on China and Africa ahead of FOCAC, and what I thought I would do is I'd uh, give my short presentation in two parts. First, learning from China, and I'm going to give a short comparison of trends and pointers to the future using the Agenda 2063 time horizon. So I'm going to show a few a bit of data from 1963, the starting point of Agenda 2063, 2013, which is 50 years after the midpoint in the Agenda 2063 horizon, and then include some data on forecasts out till 2063. In the second part of my presentation, I will look at partnering with China and recommendations for FOCAC. Let me start with something which is well known to you, which is just a basic population from 1963 until 2063. Um, it's a, a century, 100 years of uh, population. We can see how China's population has peaked and is declining, and the very rapid growth in Africa's population that uh, by 2063 will be approaching 3 billion people. Um, however, if we look at uh, GDP per capita in purchasing power parity, we can see that in 1963, Africa actually had a GDP per capita that was higher than the average for China. By 2013, China had significantly overtaken Africa in average GDP per capita. In actual fact, China's GDP per capita was about, what is it, almost three times that of Africa. And on our, what we refer to as our current path forecast, how things are likely to evolve, by 2063, GDP per capita in uh, China will be, what is it, four or five times that of Africa. China has made remarkable progress in reducing poverty. The top part of this graph shows the reduction in extreme poverty using $1.90. China is in red, Africa is in blue. And you can see the very dramatic reductions in uh, millions of extremely poor people in China compared to uh, the mediocre progress that Africa has made. In actual fact, uh, poverty in Africa is more or less uh, remaining more or less unchanged out till, uh, for, the, for the near future. By 2030, about 31% of Africans, in our view, will still be living below $1.90. Uh, or if you want to put that in millions of Africans, 522 million of Africa's 1.7 billion people uh, will still be living in extreme poverty. In the meanwhile, China on this measure has eliminated extreme poverty and done so several years ago. So I guess the question that I ask is why has China prospered and why is Africa not? There are demographic reasons there is agricultural reasons, uh, early agricultural reform, followed by a manufacturing-led growth path facilitated by China's market size and the stability and develop and a stability and a developmentally orientated governance. Now, there are many explanations, and there are many people on this call who know much more about China and Africa than I do. And they could probably add to some of these factors. But I want to make a few comments on some of these on these five issues that I've chosen to illustrate the where we can learn from China and, uh, and, and the road that lies ahead. So economic growth is a function of labor, capital, and technology. Uh, the contribution of each of these uh, contribute to a long-term, well, they contribute to, to economic growth. And at low levels of development, labor contributes about one third to one half of economic growth. So Africa has got a huge and a growing youthful population. 
So why is Africa not growing rapidly if labor is so important? The answer lies, of course, in the fact that Africa has not yet benefited from a demographic dividend. Now, a demographic dividend is simply the relationship of working age people, 15 to 65, to elderly and children. And here I present a population pyramid. And there are many ways to look at the demographic dividend. You can look at the ratio. If the ratio is above 1.7 and above, the ratio of working age people to a dependence, countries grow. Or you can look at age. Or you can look at uh, the population structure or fertility rate. I prefer to use the, the ratio of working age to people to illustrate um, uh, the importance of demographics. This is a graph that shows the demographic dividend of China versus the demographic dividend of Africa. Now, remember that I said that you enter your demographic dividend when the relationship of working age people to dependents is 1.7 and above. This is shaded. So China entered its demographic dividend at about 1983, and it peaked at an extraordinary level of about uh, almost 2.8 working age people to dependents. Only the Asian tigers have compared to this. Africa only gets to its demographic dividend in about 2050. So after 2050, that is three decades from now, Africa starts benefiting from its demographic dividend. In actual fact, until about 1985, demo, uh, demographics had, was an increasing drag on Africa. And although things are improving, it is significantly slow. So one of the main reasons why China and the Asian Tigers have done so well is because they benefited from an immense demographic dividend, almost unparalleled in global uh, history. The second reason I mentioned was just the fact that what China did is it went through an agricultural revolution, first through agrarian reform, land reform, and that unlocked food security and that allowed a solid base for growth. Africa has not done that. We speak a lot about agriculture in Africa. And what this graph shows, it shows the percent of GDP in China and Africa of agriculture, the contribution. You can see where China came from when um, uh, the large role that um, agriculture has played in its transition. Without that solid foundation, first of food security, of feeding your people, and eventually then going up the agricultural value chain, uh, you cannot grow. The third reason I mentioned was that um, Af China embarked on a manufacturing-led growth path. Now, manufacturing is unique amongst the sectors between services and agriculture, that manufacturing infuses agriculture and services. It transforms your economy. And whereas China in, let's say, 1963, had a manufacturing of about 42%. This is an estimate nobody really knows. And about 33% in 2013. By 2063, according to this forecast, um, China will still have um, a contribution from manufacturers of about 36%. Whereas Africa, 13, 14, maybe up to 22% over this long time horizon. In actual fact, Africa is deindustrializing from relatively low levels of manufacturing. And that means that we cannot transform our economies towards greater productivity. The other fact that I mentioned, of course, is that of market. China is one market. We all know this picture of how small China is compared to the landmass of Africa. But China is one integrated country, whereas we have 55 countries that are members of the Africa Union. And if we then look at what has happened with the um, economy of China, look at that massive growth rate uh, compared to the very mediocre growth rates that we've seen in Africa in terms of uh, growing the economy. Without a large market, very difficult to grow. Governance has been another factor in China's rise. This shows the three dimensions of governance that normally sequentially unfold over time the building of a security community, a capacity, and then inclusion. Of course, China, Africa does much better on inclusion than China, but on security and on capacity, particularly on capacity, based on its centuries, thousands of years of building a Chinese society and country 
China has a capacity that is well beyond that in Africa. So why is China pro-prospered and Africa not? Because China has benefited from a huge demographic, demographic dividend, while Africa will only start benefiting after about 2050. Agra China embarked upon agrarian reform to ensure food security and eventually an agricultural revolution as a foundation. Africa has not yet experienced an agricultural revolution. China adopted a manufacturing-led growth path that culminated in factory China, the powerhouse of the world, while Africa is deindustrializing. China benefits from a single internal market, which Africa could only partly achieve through the implementation of the African continental free trade area, uh, and that is only beyond 2034, when the continental free trade area uh, is fully operationalized. China has an internal stability with an effective government that has prioritized its people's development, if sometimes ruthlessly so. So what must Africa do? We must take demographics seriously. Without um, looking at our relationship of our working age people to dependence, our populations grow so rapidly that it's almost impossible to build enough schools, feed, educate our children. That is not by any stretch an advocacy for a one-child policy. It is simply that we need to look at family planning and uh, education of women and men. Africa needs to unlock its agricultural potential through tenure reform, first for food security and poverty alleviation, and then for export. We need to invest in know-how, new technologies that unlock productive transformation, such as renewables and ICT, what some people refer to as industries without smokestacks. We need to pursue vigorously the continental free trade area as a first step towards greater market integration. We need to pursue stability and democratic accountability. Africa will not, African citizens will not allow a demographic, democratic regression on the continent. And there we are very, very different to China. So, this is what could happen. We've modeled what the impact could be of an aggressive Agenda 2063 scenario, what that could be on poverty numbers in Africa. The top graph, the dashed blue line, is the impact on poverty uh, in millions of extremely poor Africans. Uh, and the bottom graph uh, is that in uh, percent of population. So it will take us 30, 40 years under the best of circumstances to get where China was um, in the uh, 2012, 2015, around there. So let's look at, in the second part of, in a brief part of my presentation, let's look at China-Africa relations. So it, I think it's very obvious that there's a lot that we can learn from China. It, it, it's the way China has uh, grown and lifted people out of poverty. It's just absolutely amazing. And China is hugely important for Africa. And Africa has gained significant from China, as we've heard um, a few minutes ago. But there are real issues of concern. Firstly, China, like others, is in Africa in pursuit of its domestic and foreign priorities. That's just a statement of fact. Its interests are conducted commercially largely, particularly its lending practices, which are often above commercial rates. And we have an unsustainable trading deficit at more than 20 billion US dollars per annum. This is, we cannot continue with this kind of, of relationship going forward. So, firstly, we need to work towards an African common position where there is full transparency on all loan agreements with African governments, state-owned enterprises, and special purpose vehicles from all Chinese banks, including on, on collateral and barter type trade arrangements. At the moment, the secrecy challenges that we face, not only from China, um, is a huge disincentive in the so-called hidden debt challenges. There needs to be full reporting of all loans, including to governments, SOEs, and special purpose vehicles on the World Bank portal. That does not happen, as Zambia recently discovered. We need to strengthen cooperation with China and internationally on the sharing of tax information, cooperation on money laundering, setting of international standards for tax transparency, and to counter base erosion and profit sharing. We need to seek concessional loans from China at rates close to, rates close to or equivalent to what the IMF and the World Bank offers. So generally, 
Africans need to look after our interests. We need, to, in the interests of our people, we need to maintain a healthy focus on human rights. In our instance, human rights are individual rights, not, not collective rights, on democracy and the primacy of a rules-based international order where might uh, does not triumph. Work towards an Asia-Africa ratings agency, which is an obvious statement given the dominance of uh, Moody, Standard Poor's, and Fitch. Encourage knowledge transfers and the location of Chinese manufacturing in Africa for the, to service the African market so that we um, have domestic production, not uh, merely imports of finished products from China. Gain access to Chinese markets for African producers. There is, that is improving, but there is a huge potential uh, to enter the massive Chinese market. Encourage additional investments from China into Africa. Colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to have spoken uh, to you. I will post a, a copy in the chat function of the future of Africa. It's free and open access available. And uh, April, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to speak at this event. Thank you very much, Dr. Celius. You definitely did not disappoint with your presentation today. It was very hard hitting and very sobering, if I may put it that way. It's quite practical. It's something that you really need to, you raised key points in your, in your presentations. And you, you asked the key question, um, why has China prospered and Africa hasn't prospered? And you, you, you highlight the key issues um, such as the, I thought I had my video. And you highlight key issues such as the such as the demographics that are involved in 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 raising China's growth, agriculture, the food security, the manufacturing, the economy, and you indicate also how we're in we're deindustrializing in Africa, and also you compare how China is an integrated market compared to us. Obviously, we're very diverse, and. Um, you also indicate a very key points on, 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 on the things that we should also learn uh, from China, issues of having an African common position. You raise the concerns and challenges that we should uh, look at, like the trade deficit. And you also maintain, you also uh, argue that we should um, look into the issues of transparency and also have uh, st structures such as an African rating agency but hearing your presentation at the end of the day it seems the onus is on the africa side which is really why we're having this presentation the issue of african agency and not just agency but ensuring that we implement some of the things we're supposed to do in order to to meet or to have capacity in in our collaboration with focac um, i would like to again also as i now close this session I'd like to invite everyone to definitely get uh, Dr. Celius's books. I know that, and as she said, they are free. I know that you, we will all get something out of that. We'll definitely get one for our, get them for our lab, for our library, Dr. Celius. Um, on that note, I want to thank all our panelists for this session for their for their great presentations, and I would like us to move on without wasting any time. To the next session. As I indicated at the beginning of this program, um, all questions and answers will be addressed during the, 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 the discussion period, but you are free to send chats in the meantime. At this point, so I would like to bring in my very good friend, uh, Professor Hu Beliang, who is the Executive Dean of the, at, uh, of the Belt and Road School at Beijing Normal University in Beijing, China. Professor Hu, the platform is yours. Thank you, Yazili, April. Thank you so much for the invitation to uh, have me. I have learned a lot from the uh, first session discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my, uh, you know, honor to welcome three distinguished panelists in this session of the discussion. We have representatives very lucky from South Africa, from Ghana, and from United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. 
Very briefly, let me introduce the three distinguished speakers. The first speaker is Professor Sepamanna Zong, Zongdi. Professor Zongdi is currently the chairman of South African BRICS Think Tank Council and a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg and a consultant on research and strategy since 2005. He previously headed the Institute for Global Dialogue that facilitated dialogue on trade, investment, development, governance, and security, peace in various African countries, as well as countries elsewhere, often in partnership with organizations in those countries. The second, so you can see the information on the screen. Uh, the second speaker is Mrs. Pamela Kosnick. I just to make a little bit shorter. She is the executive director of the Avro Silo Center of International Relations in Ghana. She is currently also working at the Kofi Annan Center of Excellence, Advanced Information and Technology Institute, also in Ghana. She has worked at the Justice uh, Accelerate arm of the uh, H Institute for the Internationalization of Law. She also worked with Ghana's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. The third speaker is Dr. Robert. Listen, listen. Uh, Dr. Robert is the chief of the energy infrastructure and uh, service sec section of the private sector uh, development and the, and the finance division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, based in Addis uh, Ababa, uh, Ethiopia. His job will focus on private sector investment in African countries, particularly in the area of infrastructure. He has over 15 years of experiences in undertaking research and advising African countries and organizations on infrastructure policy, as well as transport and trade facil facilitation issues. So according to the rules, uh, please, each panelist, your speaking time is 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes, please. Try to make your time, limit your time to be used as efficiently as possible. Thank you very much for your cooperation. That's first. Inviting Professor Sepamandala Zong, uh, Zong, Zongdi. He is now, he's going to talk about the African agency, yeah. African China, China governance in agency. So you change the title. I uh, read the title before. Okay, according to the title, <laughs> the mentioned. So please, uh, African and China Tit governance, the emergency. Title, titles change all the time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, please, 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 uh, greetings to everybody and uh, much appreciated. I would recognize that quite a number of things have been raised by the presenters before, art, especially uh, Yaki's um, magisterial um, uh, coverage of the, of the subject. So. Just wanted to comment just a little bit about this uh, fact that the two sides are emerging at the same time in a world that is not actually changing in fundamental ways. And that's the most important thing. When I talk about emergence, I want to apologize that the, the graph I use is from the World Bank. Uh, therefore, it uses that insulting word, sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's not my word. I would have called it Africa uh, because I don't know where sub-Saharan Africa, where sub begins. Um, it splits certain countries into two. It's a colonial invention. It's a Western view of Africa. When Africa is seen from the top, there is a sub-Saharan and then there is a Mediterranean, which is not part of Africa in, in public um, imaginations in, in the West. So I apologize for that word sub-Saharan Africa. It just comes with it. Thing. I couldn't shade it out. Yeah, but that is how it is projected this emergence. So of course, the, the rise of China is very remarkable. It's huge, it's massive. But there is a change in the situation in Africa as well as represented in this graph. 
Um, there is also a change in attitudes. If you look at what this graph says about how attitudes towards China and Africa are becoming, and what the other graphs show about how attitudes, especially in the business sector about Africa is happening, it suggests that they set up an emergence happening almost at the same time. Uh, of course, uh, this emergence is backed up by a huge uh, flow of funds uh, that relate to this relationship, uh, which makes it an emergence of a, a, a new funding opportunity, a new, a new sort of capital uh, that is happening. Obviously, uh, it is also happening at a people-to-people level. Uh, 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 David Minyai indicated the numbers of people that are found on both sides, the number of Africans who now in China and the Chinese who are in Africa, it, it, the list developed part of the relationship, but it, there are signs that it is growing. If you look just at students um, uh, uh, from Africa and where they go, um, China has come from far, far, far behind uh, to catch up uh, with Europe and, and North America in, in many, many ways. Very quite close in terms of projection. The numbers are still different, but in the terms of the, the tenacity of growth, um, you're seeing a massive growth. Of course, there's also emergence backed up by this idea of big plans and uh, big institutions, big ambitions and goals and, and budgets and stuff like that. That all happened. So the rise of China is evident, but the decline of the rest is not so evident because sometimes the rise of China is assumed to be a decline of someone else. For that reason, this rise needs to be uh, uh, taken with great care. The GDP for the world and the GDP cap capital for, for Africa uh, shows that uh, the, the rise of China is massive, but the, uh, the, 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 the GDP of the world has been growing at a much lower pace and than that of China. Beyond uh, the UN Security Council, it is not quite clear fully where the political rises happen beyond the bit of diplomacy here and there. So we might actually be talking about economic uh, rise and economic significance a lot more than we actually talk about political significance, which is why in discussing the issues about China and Africa, we often bring in the political. Um, for, for very good reasons, like democracy, human rights, and stuff like that. When actually, in reality, if you come to think about it very closely, this whole thing is fashioned on two elements, traditional cultures and economy, not the politics. So it's unlike the growth of relationship between Africa and the West, or Africa and other parts uh, of the world. Um, uh, China is rising and is solving its own problem. It sees itself as developing at the same time, yet it's seen by everybody as developed or increasingly developed by now. Um, uh, it, it, it sees the world as its market. Um, it, it sees the world as its market, and that's, and that's very important. Um, but whether it sees the world as its sphere of influence uh, in the same way as Western global powers do when they rise. They see a market and they see a sphere of influence. Whether the Chinese see it as a sphere of influence, I seriously doubt, which is why there's some who urge uh, China to assert itself a lot more, meaning assert itself politically a lot more. But is, is that how um, China is rising? I think we're influenced by models of rise that come uh, uh, from, from the West. Um, <clears throat> Um, the, therefore, the rise of global power since the 16th century does not help us to understand the rise of China. It does not help us. Um, there is no evidence that China wants to replace the, the, the United States. There is evidence that the China wants to overtake the United States. That's diff two different things. Whether it wants to replace the United States and take uh, responsibility for global uh, governance and the direction and all that, it, 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 there is it. There's no evidence that it has the capacity also to control the world in the manner that Western powers are able to. The Western powers continue to control the world, uh, but perhaps China may dominate the world. 
which is two different things. Uh, it seems that not to have even an appetite for it. So now China is rising for what? It seems to me uh, for domestic interest. Uh, it, it is rising because it is solving its domestic interest, which uh, Yaki was showing. It is solving its interest and in the process it rises. Whereas Western powers were, were rising because rising was significant. Being global was significant. Being global power was significant. But in the process, they will also solve that domestic interest. So the, the two might be linked in an inverse uh, direction. It, 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 it's got capital and, and, and there are many other things. It sees itself as, a world, as, as an important contributor to world civilization and stuff like that. The peaceful rise of China is in the eyes of China. The, the Chinese desire to see their rise, therefore, is peaceful because they are not projected to dominate something elsewhere or to dislocate those who want to dominate. It's as if China wants to say, U.S. continue to dominate, but let us um, economically prosper more than you so that we can have this dominance even if we have a three trillion debt. It's fine. We don't want to replace you. We simply just want to rise, acquire it, and better value, uh, acquire more resources, continue to solve our domestic debt, which is why China considers itself a developing country because there's huge uh, domestic uh, issues yet to be done. Uh, the, the, the view China has, it comes from the Sinocentric philosophy, is this is rising as coexistence, as mutual benefit, as friendship. But because it is rising in a world order which is hierarchical by nature, it cannot avoid suspicion that it is also hierarchical in its, in its thing. So we interpret, we impugn, our experience into the, into the story. Uh, it is, is it rising against global hegemony? That is our wish, but it is not actually to them, which is why you find a lot of disappointment sometimes on the African continent that China is not being, um, is not pushing for fundamental transformation in a big way and, and removing this colonially constructed uh, global order. No, that's not what it wants to do. It, it simply just wants uh, to become a significant player in the world affairs and solve its own problem. Yeah, so, so this is creating, um, it, it, there's a lot of other things we can raise here, but I don't wanna, it took too much time. Uh, I just, I do wanna point out that the danger of us in Africa repeating the fears of the worst in our country. The danger of us, the first danger I indicated is the one where we, 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 we place our own hope on China to behave the way we would wish it to do on global issues. I can understand on China-Africa direct issues, but on global issues, expecting to play our role and defend our interest in global affairs and stuff like that. There's, danger in that. There's also a danger in us repeating the fears of the worst about Africa because the worst is embedded in the hierarchical order. And it is in its interest to defend the current order, which is hierarchical, which, which, which makes it necessary that a few must prosper at the top and the majority must be always be chasing and developing a permanent future. It will, it will never be, there will never be an equal world in a hierarchical order and all that. So it fears this and therefore it, it, it acts out its fear even on our environment, sends NGOs, um, sends narratives to us about China, the new colonial power and stuff like that. We may have our own challenges with Africa, but it's not quite the same as that arising from a hierarchical order, in my view. Um, yeah, and, and, but that danger leads to another danger where we want to place uh, China in a point where it is a saver, a saver for us uh, from this devil of, 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 a, of a global order that we see. Uh, so, um, uh, I just don't want to cover all of that, but I just want to end it by saying right, the rise uh, of China and the rise of Africa are of both in the interest of Africa, definitely, because it creates opportunities for Africa to pursue its interest and not place it in, on the table of China. Neither should China do the same. Uh, Africa needs the Chinese experience. China needs the African uh, support in the world, 
because of the numbers of African countries in the, in the UN and other global forums. So both represent something odd, and that is why the uh, forecast has an opportunity to fashion this into something uh, interesting and unique, combining Africa's wish for more fundamental transformation of global order, because it sees the hierarchical global order as trapping it in marginality permanently, and still uh, meet China's uh, wish to be a significant uh, actor in, in global affairs. But that would require continuous, honest, and frank dialogue on the basis of Africa's perspective and China's perspective and nobody else's borrowed perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Songdi. I, I find a very interesting concept, emerging convergence. China has been racing, you know, for over the past years. Uh, African, you know, comparing in, you know, uh, the years has been uh, a lot of progress have been making. So I like uh, this uh, concept, uh, convergence. I, 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 I believe if uh, African countries leaders taking the recommendations from Dr. Jackie Cesar's, he made a very presentation. Chinese experience can be learned by reading his book. And also, as uh, Professor Zongdi mentioned, that China also needs support from African countries. And then, so we will see the convergence in the near future. This is mega trends if we're working together. Okay, thank you so much. And yeah, I, 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 I must point out that our, uh, you know, Mr. Rio, the minister mentioned the previously very good points, and uh, he uh, mentioned a lot of Chinese experience for your reference. You need to also read his uh, presentation in the first session. Now let's uh, turn to the second speaker, uh, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Palmer Kosnick. She's going to talk about according to the schedule, okay? You know, I don't know whether they have changed of your, your, your title. Uh, according to schedule, you're going to talk about the necessity of an assessment of uh, FOCAC, Africans Agency in, secu in Securing a Win-Win Collaboration. So please, 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Chair, fellow panelists and participants, it is a pleasure and a fulfilling moment for me and my team at the AfroSino Center of International Relations to see the fruition of this event and to have you all join us in this important program. The theme for this symposium, FOCAC at 21 years, assessing preparedness for a win-win AfroSino multilateral and bilateral collaboration could not have been more apt. ASEIR, since its inception, has sought to bring together thought researchers, thinkers, and scholars within the Afro-Sino space and beyond to engage and conduct research on Africa-China relations. We find that China has been a strategic partner of the continent, and we intend to critically analyze and assess Africa's engagement with China to one, support policymakers and stakeholders in their quest to secure a win-win collaboration. Two, provide a platform for research-based analysis and discussions on Afro-Sino collaboration. Three, bridge the information and knowledge gap that exists among policymakers, researchers, and the public. And then finally, to create a community of Afro-Sino scholars and thinkers. Permit me a heartfelt gratitude to the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, and its strategic partners for the opportunity to speak to the necessity of an assessment of FOCA, Africa's agency in securing a win-win collaboration. The center, ASEIR, is mandated among other things to produce an AU FOCA assessment report, which would analyze Afro-Sino relations using the African Union's 50-year development plan captured in Agenda 2063 and the Beijing Action Plan particularly 2007 to 2009, and FOCAC declarations as foundational documents. The three-year ruling full assessment report would be expected to support policymakers, stakeholders, and the public in shaping Afro-Sino relations. 
and network of scholars from around the globe recognize the need for African agencies and thinkers to be strategically positioned and supported to monitor and evaluate the two partners for the purposes of accountability and learning, among others. Both partners will be better served if this mechanism is well coordinated in an independent and objective manner. As a centre, we have the view that the time has come for both Africa and its Chinese partners to reflect on FOCAC and join the efforts being made by thinkers and scholars on the continent and beyond for a coordinated, independent, objective and research-based assessment of the engagement. Some work has been done in this regard and we continue to see agency on the part of Africa to ensure a win-win partnership with China. And this symposium is a testament to this fact. Both China and Africa, by virtue of the experiences with foreign partners, understand the need for such a collaboration and have a disposition to support such efforts. It is against this backdrop that has become pivotal that the African Union Commission, through its agencies like Order Nepad, and most importantly, the African people, make it a priority to ensure that the partnership with China is mutually beneficial in a way that addresses and reflects the Africa we want. We do not only require agency, but agency. There is an urgent need for the continent to build strong institutions that utilize the great minds of African thinkers and scholars in its efforts to realize Agenda 2063. in technology, the AUC and its strategic partners have an opportunity and mandate to utilize them as per the vision of the African Union to have an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the international arena. More importantly, the AUC and its strategic partners must commit to raising more thinkers and scholars being mindful of and thinkers could be supported and positioned to play a central role in these efforts. Partnership and effective collaboration between thinkers, scholars and the AUC and its strategic partners is pivotal in conducting research and leading the calls for an assessment of FOCAC. The constraints of conducting and of conducting independent and research necessitates the need for information sharing and close partnership with both African and Chinese stakeholders. ASCIL will continue to build a strong network of thinkers and scholars determined to support the AU and FOCAC in ensuring the engagements are indeed mutually beneficial and aligned with the aspirations of the African people expressed in Agenda 2063. I would want to believe that most thinkers and scholars present here have more questions they hope to explore and possibly find answers to through research. In fact, there are more questions to be answered and explored than there are answers to the issues that confront afro sino relations. There's synergy in the work scholars have done trying to answer some of these questions, and we find that effective partnership and collaboration among think tanks and research centers in this space would be invaluable in shaping afro sino relations. For example, a paper authored by Professor Adams Budomu and edited by Professor Paul Tembe and Vusi Goumed ASCIL's piece on playing the long game, Chinese soft power, also takes a different approach to unearth some of the subtle underpinnings on afro sino engagements. Works such as these have been useful in understanding and explaining peddling narratives in afro sino engagements. On the other hand, works like the Zambian case study, Chinese labor practices on the continent, done by the center, show rather visible practices and issues that could potentially mar afro sino engagements, especially from amongst their populace, if not addressed properly. 
I'll be preaching to the choir if I continue to give examples and stress the urgent need for researchers and thinkers to be engaged in assisting the AUC and Chinese partners in shaping their engagements. As ASCIR continues to work with scholars around the globe in producing knowledge and material that will support the efforts of stakeholders, we also entreat all stakeholders to support the efforts of thinkers and scholars in their work. We hope that this symposium will lead to more strategic partnerships and will set the pace for collaborations, which will expedite and necessitate a win-win collaboration between Africa and China. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Parmana Kosmik posed a very good uh, uh, suggestion. After 21 years, we need to do some assessment works in relation to FOCAC to improve further the quality of cooperation and to uh, get a win-win, a better win-win situation in the future. So I, uh, I think we should, uh, she mentioned some of the points which is very important, like information sharing, uh, independent assessment. I think we need to work together to do this kind of work so that means we have a lot of opportunities uh, for academic guys working together, researchers, you know, your research institutions working together from now on. Thank you so much. So, uh, Mrs. Pamela Kasnik, thank you. So let's uh, turn to the last, but not the least the speaker of this panel discussion, Dr. Robert Nissink. He's going to uh, share with us on China-Africa collaboration and its impact on the African continent, so free trade area agreement. Please, Robert. Thank you so much. I think I have a presentation uh, that will be- Oh, learned. great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not going to change the title uh, of my- <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, China-Africa cooperation and the impact on the African continental free trade area. So basically, <clears throat> What I want to do uh, in the next 10 minutes is to show the opportunities uh, that uh, the African continental free trade area provides for China-Africa collaboration in infrastructure uh, development. And also, actually, uh, China-African cooperation in infrastructure development has the potential to enhance uh, the benefits of the African continental free trade area. And I'm going to show this uh, with the findings of our research at ECA, a brand new study on the implications of the continental free trade area for the demand of transport infrastructure and services. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we see uh, infrastructure as a bridge uh, between China-Africa cooperation and the African continental free trade area. So it's, it's a kind of a, uh, an interface uh, between the two. So basically what we are saying is that one way China Africa cooperation can support. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry. Professor Professor Hu Biliang. Our panelist is we can barely hear him. Could you right. could that please be addressed? The voice. You cannot hear me, but I'm not No, speaking. we cannot hear the speaker. You but don't, can you, see you don't listen to me. Listen to your robot. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> can you hear me now? Because I'm losing okay. some perfectly. Is it better? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, good. All right. So I was saying that infrastructure uh, development cooperation between China and Africa is an interface uh, between this cooperation and the African continental free trade area. And I was saying that uh, I was going to use the findings of uh, ECA study to show the opportunities that the continental free trade area offers for collaboration between China and Africa in infrastructure development. Next slide, please. Uh, just the context, as we all know, the continental free trade area was only launched in January this year. And I think that uh, it is a bit premature to talk about the performance of the continental free trade area. Of course, people have made, uh, including ECA, projections in terms of the growth in trade as a result of the continental free trade area. We've also made projections in terms of the infrastructure requirement. Uh, to meet the continental free trade area. So I think it is relevant uh, to explore how collaboration between Africa and China in infrastructure development can support uh, the continental free trade area. So this is the context of my presentation. Next slide, please. Well, uh, 
China Africa Cooperation uh, in Infrastructure Development has a policy framework, uh, clearly. Uh, in Beijing, most of us were there in 2018. China and Africa agree to build synergy between the Belt and Road Initiative and development strategies of African countries. And basically, this is uh, Agenda 2063. And for us, it is the program also for infrastructure development in Africa. We've also heard that over 40 African countries have uh, MOUs on BRI uh, with, with, with China. So it's, I think it is fair to say that uh, there's an institutional framework uh, for, for collaboration and in infrastructure between Africa and, and China. I think in terms of uh, the, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, I think it focuses uh, on, on in infrastructure interconnectivity. Uh, it's supposed to run between Asia, Europe, and Africa. But one has to say that uh, the corridors linking China and Africa are not so explicitly uh, mentioned uh, in some of the core Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, documents. But this is an opportunity because it provides uh, Africa the chance to ensure that uh, collaboration in Belt and Road is entrenched or is built on the continent's own uh, infrastructure programs, such as uh, PIDA. Next slide, please. Now, I did mention uh, ECA study, uh, which I said uh, would offer some opportunities for collaboration between uh, China and Africa in infrastructure development. So what did we try to find out? Three things. One, how will the implementation of the continental free trade area affect the demand for transport infrastructure and services on the continent? Two, what would be the demand for different modes of transport? And what are the implications for investment in infrastructure development? Three, what would be the needs in terms of transport infrastructure and equipment for the different transport modes with, impl with the implementation of the Belt and Road, the, uh, sorry, the Continental Free Area? So the next slides will just provide answers uh, to these uh, questions. And in that process, you will see the opportunities that uh, the continental free trade area offers for collaboration between Africa and China. Now, what's the scenario of this study? We have four scenarios. One is to look at, uh, we we'll call it S1, scenario one, where the continental free trade area is fully implemented. And also, we don't implement our regional programs on the continent. We do have PIDA projects. We do have projects uh, of the regional economic communities. And so scenario one is where Continental free trade area is implemented, but the continental projects are not implemented. Scenario two, the most important, interesting one is there's a maximum implementation of the continental free trade area, but we also do everything in terms of implementing our regional projects. Scenario three is uh, the continental free trade area is not implemented. We also don't implement our regional infrastructure project. And finally, scenario four is uh, we don't implement the continental free trade area. We also, but we do implement our regional projects. Next slide, please. Now I take you uh, to, to the answers. And in answering these questions, uh, you would see uh, the opportunities that we have for collaboration between China and Africa. So in terms of the question on how will the implementation of the continental free trade area affect demand for transport infrastructure and services, we see that the introduction of the free trade area leads to a general increase in intra-African freight demand of about 28% compared uh, to a scenario if we don't implement the continental uh, free trade area. And you can see uh, the, the, the change in, 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 in freight for the different modes of transport. So there will be 22% increase. By 2030, remember the baseline is uh, 2019. So we are seeing an increase in 8% uh, in railways uh, in 2030 compared to 2019. Maritime transport, we see a massive uh, jump in, in, in freight through this mode uh, by 62%. And in air transport, we see a 28% uh, increase as a result of the continental free trade area. Next slide, please. Uh, so what would be the demand for different modes of transport as a result of the continental free trade area. Uh, at the moment, the intra-African freight transport demand is heavily skewed in favor of the road transport mode. So we have about 77% of uh, transport uh, by, by, by road, with a modal share of rail close to 
zero percent, frankly, the, the goods that are transported by rail in Africa today, in African trade, is, is very, very slow. Uh, African trade policies to expand rail network in combination with trade policies to implement the continental free trade area are expected to change uh, this distribution. In fact, in the scenario with the free trade area implemented and planned infrastructure and services activated, the modal share of rail would increase from 0.3% to 7%. I think this is an opportunity uh, for China and Africa to collaborate in investment in railway. I think China is already doing quite a bit. Uh, Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, uh, the Mombasa to Nairobi. I think most of the massive uh, rail projects in Africa today are, are, are constructed by uh, by Chinese company. So we see opportunities going forward. Next, please. Uh, what would be the needs in terms of transport infrastructure for different modes with the implementation of the African continental free trade area? I think this is key, is critical because it speaks to the infrastructure requirements as a result of the continental free trade area. I think what we have done is that the identification, we have identified critical uh, transport uh, links on the continent. So what we do, we look at the, the, the load that the different links are carrying today, and we compare them to 2030 when the continental free trade area is implemented. By doing so, we have identified those links that require upgrades again if you look at the details of this study, you'll be able to see where Africa and China can collaborate uh, in infrastructure development in the context of the continental free trade area. Next slide, please. And you could see from, from, from this map uh, where I have encycled uh, those red links, uh, those are where we are projecting as critical uh, links. That's where we are projecting, we are seeing massive increase uh, in, 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 in freight uh, movement. So here we do that by looking at the ratio between the flows in 2019, the baseline, and uh, the flow in 2030. So by doing that, we're able to see uh, those links that require uh, upgrades in order to meet uh, the demands of the continental free trade area. Next slide, please. Uh, what would be the need in terms of transport equipment for the different transport modes with the implementation of the continental free trade area. When I say equipment, I'm talking about vehicles, trucks, trains, vessels, and airplanes. We are trying to compute uh, the quantity of this equipment that we will need as a result of the continental free trade area. So if you see the first uh, uh, bus, they speak to truck and we see that there will be a 41% increase in the requirements of trucks on the continent. Uh, there will be trucks for bulk cargo. In terms of co container cargo, it will even be as high as, as 64%. Uh, if you look at airplanes, for instance, we see that we will need 53% uh, increase in airplanes on the continent as a result of the continental free trade area. Next, please. Uh, these slides also show you, in terms of absolute numbers, uh, the, 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 the number, the quantity of trucks that will require in, in thousands. So today, the baseline that was not today, so to speak, but the data in 2019, we see that we had 60, 69,000 uh, uh, trucks, 698,000 trucks on the continent. but. If by scenario one, for instance, we will implement the continental free trade area, we will see that we will need 1,844,000 uh, trucks on the continent. So this is huge investment uh, for Chinese uh, companies to, to partner with, with, with Africa to make sure that we have the equipment, the, the, the trucks that we will need to transport uh, goods on the continent as a result of the continental free trade area. Next slide, please. Uh, this, again, is regarding uh, rail. So you could see the quantity of wagons that we had in 2019, and you could see uh, the required number of wagons that we have uh, as a result of the continental free trade area in the year 20, 
uh, 30. I think this is an interesting uh, one. Uh, China has showed its interest not only in working with Africa to build a high-speed rail network on the continent, but also in manufacturing uh, trains and, and, and wagons. So there will be huge opportunity uh, for China to collaborate with Africa in the context uh, of uh, the continental uh, free trade area. Next slide, please. And here I just show you you uh, are the, the, the needs uh, for number of vehicles, uh, vessels that we would need on the continent in the context of maritime uh, transport. This is, uh, this is quite interesting because we see a growth in demand uh, for maritime transport uh, as a result of the continental free trade area. I think this is something that we have not investigated in detail, how much of inter-African trade is happening by sea. Uh, what this study has revealed is that there's potential uh, for demand for maritime transport, even for intra-African trade. Next slide, and I'm going towards the end of my presentation. This just shows you uh, the demand uh, for, for aircraft as a result of the continental free trade area. Now, again, you have uh, this, this slide. You will uh, be able to go through this carefully and uh, to, to, to see the findings uh, of our study in detail. Next slide, please. And let me just conclude that by saying that uh, opportunities for China-Africa cooperation is huge in terms of upgrading the critical transport links that we have identified uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we have the infra infrastructure to carry the increased uh, volumes of goods that we are anticipating as a result of the continental free trade area. But in doing so, we're insisting that we should build uh, on the program for infrastructure development in, in Africa. And finally, there's also opportunities for China and Africa to collaborate in the acquisition of transport equipment. I have just demonstrated uh, in this short time the number of trucks, rail wagons, vehicles, and uh, aircraft that we will need in the context of the continental free trade area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, yeah, today, can can you all uh, guys hear me? So you just you mentioned you cannot you you cannot hear me. Can no, you? No, we could hear you. It was okay, uh, Dr. Great. Lissinger. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you so much again, Robert. I think uh, what you discussed about uh, African continental uh, free trade zone area now is a hot topic, and as you know that China has been building. 21 uh, FTA in China uh, is a time, very good timing, I think, very good timing. Uh, African countries and China learn from each other because we have been, uh, you know, also building free trade zone in China. So not only working in the area you mentioned in relating to transportation infrastructure, but uh, overall, you know, uh, like uh, manufacturing agrar uh, agrarian development services, right? And particularly, I would like to mention that uh, this is also a very good opportunity for African countries and China working together based on the Belt and Road Cooperation, International Cooperation Platform. Uh, China has been uh, focusing on some of the areas. One of the most important area, area is uh, infrastructure, particularly transportation infrastructure. We have been uh, building a lot of uh, railways, uh, railways worldwide. We have been also building a lot of railways in, uh, in African countries. So uh, working together, that will be benefit to both, to uh, African continental FTA development, but also benefit for China's investment. So this is a uh, when when our mutual benefits, uh, you know, uh, cooperation. So I believe that will be bright future. Okay, I should say you have done very well uh, in this uh, session of the discussion, at least in two aspects. One is what if you have clearly explained your great ideas and the practical policies. Uh, policies and suggestions, which is very useful to uh, improve uh, development in relating to African countries, also for China. 
The other, I think uh, you all very well control to your time. It's not, you know, it, I think it's, it's very good so that you finish your jobs, uh, you know, uh, very successfully. So I also finished my job. Thank you so much for the cooperation. My job is done, Azri. I would like to stop here. Let's move in for the next program, uh, over, uh, next session of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Hu Bilian, for, for chairing the panel so well. Um, at this stage, um, and I'm very happy that we're moving along perfectly with time. So at this stage, I'd like to bring in another good friend, Mr. Moritz Weigel, who is the director of the China-Africa Advisory in Germany. Uh, Mr. Weigel, the floor is yours. Or if I'm also announce that after this session, uh, uh, Mr. Weigel will also handle the discussions uh, period of the questions and answers. We'll go right into it after that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasini. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, um, dear colleagues. Uh, yeah, also from my side, a warm welcome to this uh, second part um, of the presentations. Uh, which will feature a very high-level academic panel uh, focusing on the topic of uh, FOCAC 2021 and beyond. Um, I'd like to contribute uh, with, with two points um, on this in, in opening this panel. Uh, one is um, the importance to uh, really look at uh, the FOCAC ecosystem as a whole as it has developed over these past two decades and where it stands now um, when uh, talking about um, FOCAC 2021 and what perhaps um, should be coming out of that. Um, and what I mean by that is to, to acknowledge that uh, FOCAC um, is much more or has become much more um, than its three-year uh, action plans. Um, but it really has built up over more than two, than more than two decades um, various institutional arrangements, um, as well as plans and programs, uh, specific uh, funds and um, different coordination mechanisms in form of uh, regular subfora under FOCAC or also other conferences. Um, and as we've heard uh, quite comprehensively this morning already from Minister Councillor Yu Yong, um, these institutions and, and plans and programs really span a wide range of different topics. So it's not only about um, finance and trade and political cooperation, um, but it really um, includes a really broad range of aspects um, from education and training to science and technology, um, to cultural and media aspects, to security aspects, um, and uh, perhaps more recently also a strong focus on industrialization, um, on addressing the climate emergency. Um, and to really like, keep that in mind when looking at uh, how can FOCAC um, contribute more in future to realizing the Agenda 2063 on the African continent, but then also more specifically um, from a country perspective to achieve the national development plans that African countries um, have formulated. And, and to do that, I think it would be important to, yeah, to look at the ecosystem as it stands, to identify gaps that it may have, um, but then also to look at the institutions that are already in place and see are there new ones needed or are perhaps some of the existing institutions um, yeah, possible to readjust them in a way to, to deliver on that. Then my second point um, is also to keep in mind that aspect of um, not only what FOCAC has achieved and African countries together with China in that context, but also um, how those achievements have reshaped the engagement of other partners with the African continent. And um, going forward, maybe also thinking about how that can be strategically used better in engagement with other partners, um, but also where are there really complementarities and how can that also work in a, in a, in a cooperative way perhaps um, better moving forward. So just two, these two aspects. Um, uh, before going in the panel discussion, uh, there are just uh, 
Yeah, I think two general points that I wanted to, to highlight. One is, um, as we've heard from the co-hosts this morning, um, this event is taking place to uh, encourage dialogue. So um, I'd really uh, encourage uh, the panelists um, coming now that they uh, uh, stick to their 10 minute uh, time limit so that we have a bit of time afterwards to engage also with the participants um, online uh, in, in that kind of dialogue. Um, and then secondly, um, looking at what we're trying to get out of this event. So some uh, concrete proposals uh, on the way forward. So I'd, I'd, uh, that would be my call to, to the panelists is to give uh, me and, and everybody I'm part of this event at least one or two concrete proposals that we can also capture as part of this um, event and, and the outcomes of it. Um, now, uh, without any further um, ado, I, I'd like to um, start with uh, uh, the introduction of the first uh, panelist, um, Professor Mamo Muchi. Uh, he is a um, uh, chair of innovation studies at the Chivani University of Technology in South Africa. Um, and he, he holds uh, degrees from Columbia University and the University of Sussex, including um, a PhD from the University of Sussex in Science, Technology and Innovation for Development. Um, he, in fact, holds uh, uh, a number of uh, very distinguished academic positions in South Africa, in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in the UK. Um, and he has also uh, taught um, at uh, various leading universities, uh, including in China, in India, um, in the UK, and, and also in the, in the US. Um, so uh, his presentation is, is going to focus on the very uh, key topic of putting Africa first, um, necessity of individual countries' readiness in bilateral relations with China towards Agenda 2063 achievements. Uh, Professor Mucci, I'm very pleased to, to uh, have you with us and uh, hand the floor over to you. Please proceed with your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't hearing you very well. Your voice, please, uh, I don't know, upgrade it because I, I heard you, but uh, very, very low. So let me uh, just, uh, I was given seven minutes, so I, I'm going to make it very brief and short short, but introduce uh, you some, uh, to some important issues. Let me just start with some inspirational uh, quotations. Uh, this is the first, one of the first presidents of uh, China, Sun Yat-sen. He says, if China follows at the heels of the imperialistic and militaristic nations, China's ascendancy to power would not only be useless, but harmful to humanity. The only glorious and honorable path for us to pursue is to maintain in full force the old policy of helping the weak and curbing the strong. He also said, when the days of our prosperity come, we must not forget the pain and misery which we are now suffering from the pressures of economic and political forces of the powers. When our country becomes powerful, we should assume responsibility of delivering those nations who suffer in the same way as we do now. That is what ta hishu means by securing tranquility. And uh, President Xi uh, Jinping also said, China's investment in Africa comes with no political strings. He also said, China does not interfere in Africa's internal affairs and does not impose its own will on Africa. He has written three books on uh, governance in China. And uh, I, I was able to read the third book. I was very fascinated about how they are thinking. I think the Chinese are thinking not in terms of also developing China and eradicating poverty from China, but also how to deal with uh, uh, like continents like Africa, which have been suffering, how they also need to relate to them and work with them and encourage them and stimulate them to actually achieve some things. Now, the interesting question you, are, you ask me is, what is the relate, what, how is China's relationship with Africa? What is unique about it? What is a part of the relationship 
that we should all actually acknowledge. The most important part of the relationship, although a lot of the discussions are on the economic trade, uh, political and other things, the most extraordinary thing China has done, which is very different from all other uh, relationships Africa has, is the, the most of the focus on the investment is on infrastructure, on roads, uh, railways, and many things like that. We, we are in that, that is a category. They, if you see all the data, all the investments, they are focused on that. In other words, no matter what problems may have in that relationship, what is interesting is that something is being built in each country. The Tanzam Railway, they started it when Chairman Mao was there. From then on, it has been going on in all parts of Africa. So they have been doing it with all the challenges that they may be uh, happening in terms of the date and uh, all these payments issues that have happened in Zambia and all these other places. But the most interesting thing is China has a, a, a very interesting relationship, more than any other relationship other countries have done with this thing. The other interesting question now you ask me is to achieve the sustainable development goals. See the uh, MDGs, uh, Millennium Development Goals, we in Africa didn't succeed. Now, we need to actually be facilitating to also achieve the uh, 2030 SDGs and the 2063 um, also uh, African, um, the achievements that we need to achieve by that. To be able to do that, what is interesting you ask me is, is China also supporting to make sure that Africans also achieve SDGs and also the, the, the Africa we want in, in 2063, 100 years after the African, uh, when we formed the Organization of African Unity. Africa's unity, will they support it? In other words, the interesting question you ask me is, is the bilateral relationship and the, also the regional, multilateral in terms of regions, and also the more main focus of achieving the 2063 unity, will that also be co coordinated very systematically so that when, one, when, when China or anybody else is uh, relating to a, a specific country, they do not create conflicts in, in, in terms of realizing the full achievement of African unity and the full achievement of the SDGs on, on time. And, the, and, and also the full achievement of the 2063 Africa we want. The interesting question you asked me is that is, it's very, uh, at the moment, what we can say, what I suggest strongly is the Chinese relationship with Africa should be, should be focused not only on, uh, um, on issues like uh, the trade and the export import and uh, minerals, this kind of things. I would prefer that we focus on what I call uh, science, technology, innovation. So my, my, without saying very much, I want to contract the Africa-China relationship in science, technology, innovation is the most important. What can Africa learn from China and, and this side? And how could we move on, uh, moving forward to actually create a very uh, concrete things about China? China-Africa collaboration has always been discussed, as I told you, in economics and, and politics and uh, trade and all this. But the China-Africa collab in science technology is very literally explored. So what we, we have done with some of my postdocs is we've started doing serious studies and we found some extraordinary data, to, to be honest with you, uh, about even on publications, patents, joint publications that African researchers do with uh, Chinese researchers. So we are now... Uh, uh, we in the in this entire uh, China Africa collaborations with technology transfer, local learning across the global value chain, in the field of science, technology, innovation is what is important. I think what we want is uh, uh, we we want to observe how technology transfer has happened from China to African countries, and even from African countries to China also. If there is a relationship, is there an exchange, a technology exchange, not just transfer? The cooperation uh, uh, so far has happened from low technology to high technology success in recent years. For example, Ethiopia is going, uh, doing, have done a launch 
in 2020 with the help of China. It's a, it's a space launch, which is very, very good. This is China got involved with it. Its smart RSS nano satellite is launched to provide Earth observation services to China and African countries. Ghana and Zambia have developed solar irrigation facilities for farmers across the country. The local solar power facilities are the big relief for the farmers with heavy electricity demand. China is cooperating with many African countries in uh, its green technology transfer. For example, China is working with Ghana and Zambia on the China-Africa South-South cooperation on renewable energy technology transfer projects. The aim of, of this uh, cooperation is to transfer renewable energy technology to African countries and enhancing off-grid community-based electrification. Chinese experts help increase uh, uh, rice production in Mozambique and new uh, uh, irrigation techniques across uh, yields. The other thing is the made in China technology now uh, serves as a backbone of network infrastructure in several African countries. Uh, uh, there is a study that I read by a guy called Grud uh, Moore, 50% of 3G systems used by African telecos were built by Huawei and another 20% to 30% were built by Z ZTE, while Huawei has built up 70% of 4G networks and is likely to build all 5G networks. That's fascinating. What you see is uh, that's quite extraordinary things are happening. Something like a lot of uh, activities, like over 700 engineering activities in very many parts of Africa have been done with Chinese engineers coming and participating and so on. What I am trying to do now is I want to write a book on this, on the science technology innovation relationship, that kind of infrastructure, how China is doing it and where the, the, China, where the way China is doing it is built on the principle of mutual benefit, on the principle of what uh, President uh, Xi Jinping and former President Sun Yat-sen said. If they follow it like that, the, China will be the best example, uh, I, to be honest with you, in, in this not easy time that we all live in, coronavirus and climate change, many things like that. It will be extremely interesting that China remains a model, becomes an example, to try to create a world where we are one humanity, one community, not just be divided by all kinds of separations. When we have problems that is boundaryless, we should also be boundaryless in the way we solve the problems. And I think China has a great example and it's a, some unique things have happened. Whatever negative things may have happened, a lot of people talk about it. I mean, they, 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 they remember what they said about Zambia, China want to take the Kenneth Kaunda airport and all these things and the electricity, all the companies, many things like that because of debt. But what we, we must now realize is that some of the concrete things in, in terms of infrastructure, engagement in each of the countries is very good. What I suggest to them is to do two things. One, generally continue the infrastructure side and make it a model. Two, make sure that whenever they relate to each country, they should make sure that conflicts that is continue to exist uh, because of the colonial legacies that has left Africa, because of that, China should try to do everything it can to make sure that the countries it's supporting are not into conflict fighting other in their in their own regions. If they do like that, I think China will be the best example. And I strongly recommend China to continue to do these positive things. And I'm very happy with them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muchi. This has been uh, really insightful. Thank you also for sticking to the time. Um, I take note of your concrete recommendations. That is really appreciated, very helpful. Uh, indeed, um, I uh, fully agree with you that uh, this aspect of infrastructure um, is a key aspect and one that um, sets aside uh, China-Africa cooperation from uh, many other uh, corporations from the African continent with other parts of the world. Um, also, your focus on science, technology and innovation. Um, this is really key. It's great to hear that you have a book planned coming on that and um, that you're already conducting uh, comprehensive research with your PhD students in that area. Um, very encouraging. Um, on the technology transfer, um, yeah, I think that is, um, that is really, uh, really a key issue. 
And and I think what is what is so important to note here is that um, China is a is a very uh, important and interesting partner when it comes to technology transfer. Um, for on the one hand, um, because as a partner from the global south, um, those technologies are mo- most likely um, more cost effective and more in tune with the socioeconomic realities also in many parts on the continent. But at the same time, China is also, as you also highlighted, a provider of um, cutting edge high tech solutions, um, you know, like the satellite launch that, that you mentioned. So, so it's really both that that is available. And I think that is also what makes uh, China such an important partner. Um, moving on to the next presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce um, Professor Tembe. Uh, he's a senior research fellow and senior lecturer um, at the Department of Linguistics and Modern Languages at the University of uh, South Africa. Um, he holds um, uh, very di- various degrees in, uh, from the University of uh, from the Uppsala University and and also. Um, from the University of Hong Kong, um, a PhD, in fact, on uh, in, in Chinese studies. Um, he is uh, a long-term uh, China expert, um, fluent in Mandarin, um, and has been uh, doing research on China-Africa relations at least since uh, the year 2005, um, published extensively um, in that area. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I mean you have you have the details on the screen, but I'd, I'd leave it at that and and hand the floor over to Professor Tembe, who will be focusing on um, the topic of Africa at the center of China shaping the world in the 21st century. Um, so uh, a rather broad topic, and I really look forward um, to your to your inputs, uh, Professor Tembe. So please uh, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I would, please, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, your excellencies, organizers, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, forum and uh, to be able to play around with ideas. Uh, ideas which I think they are linked to some of uh, some of the presentations already made. Uh, my presentation today relies heavily on my current manuscript that I'm I'm writing. It's in China, Africa, culture and language in public diplomacy. The role of culture and language in public diplomacy. So, because of time, I will move directly and go to my proposals. My first proposal, because, and this proposal comes from the concept notes of this forum, that we are evaluating and monitoring FOCAC. So I'll join the narrative of uh, Professor Sipamandla Zondi when he says, we need to reread history that involves China because our encounters with modernity did not involve China. That is industrial development and all that. We are all products of the last era. Therefore, we need a new paradigm-based instrument for evaluation because current instruments of evaluation do not include China. And for that reason, for Africa to be able to do that and to be able to benefit from China, we then need a novel cross-cultural strategies framework. And lastly, we need to harness the hard power of mineral resources that we have in Africa into soft power. How do we do that? This I do within the ambit of our, I try to explain this within uh, the parameters of the big claim that I'm making. And my big claim that I'm making is that Africa is at the center of this thing, of uh, China impacting or influencing the world or shaping the world in the 21st century. So Africa is at the center of China shaping the world in this 21st century. First, in order for us to understand this, what should we understand is that why do we enter into relationships? We enter into relationships in order to better ourselves and for no other reason, either to better our own groups or better ourselves. But how does Africa then 
in this moral goal of Africa-China relationship benefits. I borrow some wording from uh, Bordeaux here that everyone who enters into a relationship believes in the game and in the value that is at stake. China believes in that game. And one of the presenters said that China is focused domestically and is not interested in ruling the world. And Africa also should do the same. But is African agency enough to achieve this goal of us empowering Africa? So moving into evaluation, evaluation is contextual. It is dependent on the type of relationship in place and particular partnerships. Specifically, evaluation is to make judgment about the amount or value of something that you are assessing. So the main thing on evaluation is meant to help us measure our inputs vis-a-vis -vis our outputs that in the relationship that we engage upon. Now here we have to question input and output. What are Africa's inputs into China-Africa relations? Or what are Africa's inputs into FOCAC? And finally, evaluation is meant to help us ensure that outputs outweigh inputs. Otherwise, there'll be no need for us to engage in a, in a particular agency. So this brings us again to evaluation instruments, which in the long run will lead us into a specific theoretical framework, which I propose that it should be a novel cross-cultural communication strategies framework. And here I claim that United Nations evaluation instruments do not cater for FOCAC in general. International economic institutions evaluation instruments do not cater for FOCAC, nor governance evaluation instruments. So we need a new cross-cultural communication strategy in order for us to understand the relationship between China and this thing in Africa. We need a new paradigm-based instruments for evaluation of uh, FOCAC relationship. Africa-China cooperation and trade. And the reason why we need this new instrument is because the economy and trade and cooperation between Africa and China does not deviate from the main ways of doing commerce in the world. Although China offers a somehow better deal than the deals that Africa has had previously, it doesn't run away from the notions of supply and demand and making of profits in its investment. And so does Africa when it invests in China. If Africa political governance, in Africa political governance continues to be that borrowed from Western modernities. So how can we use those types of instruments in order to have a fruitful relationship with China? Like one of the presenters mentioned that in China, we have a top-down hierarchical structure of development, but we have a bottom-up type of development or a type of development that relies from bottom-up instruments in Africa. So possible and available point for a paradigm shift is to discover what is the constant of Africa global relationships historically. And once we discover this constant, we will then try and remove negative factors. But just by example, Africa has always been regarded as playing the second fiddle in a relationship. Africa has been regarded as a lesser of the two partners. Africa has been regarded as subservient in some eras. And Africa, even today within FOCAC, is regarded as lagging, lagging behind in terms of agency. So Africa needs to break this historical stigma, this constant that has affected Africa uh, throughout history. So Africa, in order to be able to do this, we need to create an African power of attraction. Everybody engages with Africa. But why, does, why is Africa not so attractive in terms of representation and in terms of agency? I make then a suggestion that we could change our hard power based on mineral and natural resources into soft power. So how do we do this? I propose that Africa should build the strategic narratives of the AU. That is the articulation 
of country mining visions and regional mining visions that go beyond driving national and regional attraction tools. The aim is to convert the hard power of natural and mineral resources into soft power. That will be Africa's power of attraction. That will put Africa on the position to be able to engage this thing, to be able to engage with other countries on a, a, a distinct and equal level. But how do we do this? Africa can formulate, for example, a law or a legislation that makes it win from natural resources long before those minerals are extracted from the ground. This is just one of practical. So my main claim for today of Africa's power of attraction is of China, of Africa being the center for China shaping the world. We have the advantage globally of China-Africa demographics, China-Africa trade deficits, Africa continental free trade area, spaces of leapfrogging and less need for retrofitting engineering and China-Africa cultural similarities. Africa boasts already 1.4 billion population, which is prognosed to be 2.5 billion in 250, and most of it consisting of the youth. And China consists of 1.42 billion. These two people, or this block combined, if we were to call Fokake block, this block already almost consists 50% of this thing. It coexists 50% of global uh, population. So we see the trade deficit between Africa and China, which is last year was at 17.7 billion. And, but when you look at the US trade deficit, is 621 billion. But given the demographic numbers and the fact that Africa is still a developing or in some places underdeveloped nations, we still have more role to cover the figure of this trade deficit. Now, from there, we can also take advantage of China tapping into the 3.4 trillion of the Africa continental free trade area. And lastly, it is the leapfrog moment. The fact that China, Africa is underdeveloped or developing. I can make an example here with the mobile phones. Mobile phones has extended communication and other services that were non-existent in Africa through the process of this thing of leapfrogging. So China is an advantage here. What is the advantage of China? If you look at this impact of China and the likability of China and Africa, it has increased. But also it is important to realize that it is where governments almost have similar structures to those of China in terms of hierarchy, that China has got more likability on this thing, on the continent. So my suggestion is how do we then change this image of Africa of not being able to distinct, to fend for itself, of Africa always being regarded to have its own agency. And I end my presentation by saying that Africa, China, Africa, China has got advantage of demographics, the use of Africa trade deficits, the use of AFTA, the factor of leapfrogging, and lastly, we can call China to the table and its accountability in terms of cultural similarities. Because if China has a people-based form of development, Africa also through Agenda 63 has an ideal of a, a people-based type of development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tembe, uh, for these uh, really insightful uh, points and, um, and very new aspects, I think, uh, that haven't come up in previous discussion. So um, I, I really... Chairperson, can I just come in for a minute? Sure, please, Yasini. Um, I'm getting lots of messages from people that they cannot hear you clearly. So maybe really? if you can speak to the can, laptop can, or something. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, it's better. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I just I was just saying um, huge thank you to to Professor Tembe for these uh, really uh, interesting points um, that that add new aspects to this discussion as they haven't been raised before, especially that aspect of evaluation and and monitoring of of FOCAC. Um, and doing that um, not by using existing uh, ways, but by creating really a new paradigm that uh, takes into account also those cross-cultural um, aspects. So I think that is a really, um, really interesting um, point. Um, um, also, uh, the, the other points in terms of um, yeah, the, the image, uh, the international image um, of the continent and how hard power in terms of resources can also be turned into soft power. So um, uh, well noted and thank you also for your concrete proposals. Uh, now um, we're a bit behind schedule already. I'm going to uh, introduce the next speaker who's the last speaker of this panel, um, Professor Tang Xiaoyang. Um, uh, a good, good old friend, and I'm very happy to to see you also on the panel here. Yes. Um, <laughs> hi, hi, Yang. Yeah, um, maybe just uh, briefly um, a bit also on on uh, Professor Tang's uh, background. So he's the deputy director of the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy, um, but he's also vice chair and professor in the Department of International Relations at uh, Tsinghua University. Um, and he's really an, uh, an expert on China-Africa relations in, in many areas, but perhaps particular in the, in the area of economic cooperation. Um, he has recently published with uh, Cambridge University Press, um, in fact, last year, um, a very interesting book that I can highly recommend um, on uh, co-evolutionary pragmatism, approaches and impacts of China-Africa eco economic um, cooperation. And maybe just in addition to mention that uh, Professor Tang um, is certainly uh, one of the most distinguished uh, um, uh, researchers um, and academic colleagues on China-Africa relations, but also he has quite a broad range of um, the perspective uh, more from multilateral um, organizations and development cooperation, having worked also quite extensively over the last years with, um, with the World Bank and the United Nations Development Programme um, and also bilateral donors. So, um, yeah, very pleased to have you on the panel um, and, and over to you um, to present on the topic um, of infrastructure construction and knowledge, knowledge exchange. Uh, with the question, how can China and Africa improve the quality and sustainability of their cooperation? Um, Xiaoyang, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Moritz, for the kind of introduction. And uh, your excellencies and uh, also the organizers, uh, Yazini, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, so I hope you can all hear me clearly. If you cannot, then please let me know. And uh, now I'm sharing my uh, slides and uh, yeah, you should be able to see it. And uh, yeah, as the last speaker, I also would like to actually already respond a little bit on the, what the previous speakers uh, talked. As uh, Moritz uh, introduced, uh, I uh, did a lot of research on economy, uh, on economic cooperation between China and Africa. But this is actually, I think this has a political or even ethical concern behind it. And that's my argument. Because although it looks like China always talks about commercial, about business, but in fact, that's a historical lesson for China. China find uh, China actually it's not like a spontaneous uh, went into this uh, market economy, but it was forced by the global capitalism uh, to focus on economic growth. And uh, paradoxically, when China accepts the value of this uh, global uh, capitalism, namely to join the market economy globally and uh, the, uh, launch the industrialization correspondingly. Uh, I mean, mainly during the last 40 years. It's a rapid development actually gave it the capacity to resist foreign influence and uh, to pursue more independence and uh, preserve its own culture. So therefore, when China stresses the importance of uh, economic growth in international engagements, especially like in this China-Africa, 
cooperation. It doesn't uh, completely forget uh, uh, pol politics. The devotion to the development uh, issues implies uh, both a continuity of uh, uh, China's long-term policy to support uh, uh, independence uh, of African countries against the Western hegemony, and also an approach to more effectively provide such support. So this is just uh, the general uh, theme I would like to raise as a response also to previous uh, discussions. And now I will start with um, on this specific uh, uh, perspective on infrastructure and knowledge transfer to show how this market and uh, uh, development concerns, they are combined. So Africa is, uh, uh, without doubt, it's at the vanguard of uh, rapid uh, industrialization. Actually, a lot of countries propose uh, their uh, industrialization plans. But uh, however, Africa still has a lot of underdeveloped uh, industries. And uh, <clears throat> people believe uh, the investments in infrastructure, agriculture, and other services can facilitate the growth. And uh, yeah, to tapping into these uh, opportunities could uh, be mutually beneficial for China and Africa. So although it looks like China has this uh, business concern and it has self-profit, but uh, in a market, in an equal market, it's actually also mutual benefit. So it's uh, this uh, just a line of uh, Africa's population potential. And China has been doing quite a lot of infrastructure projects, as we all mentioned, including railway, power plants, uh, and uh, uh, harbors. So I do not stay too long on this. So uh, one thing is Africa is in the dire need of a critical uh, infrastructure, like the power plants, and uh, China then has a lot of experience with infrastructure projects and uh, then uh, has a good relationship with the government to uh, launch even more. We may see actually new initiatives uh, regarding maybe not only all the uh, infrastructure, but also like this ICT, new infrastructure and also the greener and uh, yeah, more ecological infrastructure in the upcoming FOCAC. But I want to point out that during this infrastructure construction, then uh, the knowledge and the employment, so these human resources, that's always a big concern among the uh, African, but also the Chinese uh, uh, stakeholders. So the Chinese, on the one hand, the Chinese firms, they did create jobs for African workers and uh, construction and manufacturing. They are the major sectors uh, which uh, creates uh, tens of thousands of jobs. But however, the language barriers and the skill gaps uh, caused uh, some uh, difficulties for employment as well as for skill transfer. Therefore, most jobs, they are low and semi-skilled. And also, in addition, the wages, they tend to be low because they depend on skill levels, on job tenure and work experiences. And so, yeah, actually, my colleague from SOAS, Carlos Oya, they did some excellent in long time comprehensive research in Angola and in Ethiopia to show how this, uh, uh, this is the statistic from Angola, just to show the, how the skilled uh, uh, workers, they make um, much more than just low skilled workers. And uh, then to fix the skill gap and uh, utilizing uh, local talents, they are good for Africans, but also for Chinese, because uh, when you hire African workers, you can save a lot in production costs. So, uh, and then Chinese uh, companies, they created uh, a lot of orientation programs. And uh, they try to use the uh, locals uh, conversational in uh, uh, Chinese language and also uh, yeah, uh, train the locals and uh, have them uh, 
to work with the skilled labor so that they can build skills uh, gradually. This is the typical Chinese way of training. So the war, uh, so it's a work and a learn. So uh, learn on site. That's the most uh, commonly used uh, training. But they also then uh, now more and more uh, gradually build up some uh, oversight mechanism to checking for bad labor practice, like to avoid uh, this abuse of uh, workers and avoid uh, this uh, violation of uh, low minimum uh, wage. But then more important, uh, yeah, I want to say just uh, more about this uh, provision of training. It's just, uh, again, this uh, construction and uh, manufacturing. Then we see the Chinese, it's just a comparison between the Chinese and uh, other foreign companies and the Ethiopian company. That's, again, a study made by SOAS. And uh, just to show the Chinese, when they provided training, like they say, they reported to have a uh, training. In fact, uh, the Chinese are not so different from uh, other foreign companies and uh, the local companies. The trend is similar. That's uh, just a beneficial for everybody. But the Chinese uh, had uh, some uh, more uh, yeah, unique obstacles. First is the conditions between China and Africa. They are pretty big. And so therefore then the, a lot of, uh, yeah, quite a few training programs, I interviewed uh, the uh, trainees and they said that when they uh, like after learning in China or after trained by Chinese uh, teachers, when they want to really apply the knowledge to Africans' local conditions, they found it uh, quite challenging because uh, a lot of situations, uh, they, are, they are totally different. And another thing is that when the uh, uh, in trainees, they got the uh, train, they got trained, then they actually tend to make a, a very high salary. And so their turnover rate is high. So this actually uh, uh, reversely then uh, yeah, made the Chinese companies unwilling to provide more training. So this is a market mechanism, how to keep this uh, staff trained. And then uh, another problem is uh, for this uh, training, like in Tazara, Tanzania, Zambia Railway, also in this uh, RDS Djibouti Railway, Chinese companies uh, and the cooperation partners, they provided quite a few, uh, quite a lot of training for thousands of local workers. But uh, the problem is a lot of these infrastructure projects, they themselves are underperformed. They cannot uh, like uh, make a good uh, income. So this is uh, related to the turnover rate. And uh, this uh, makes the uh, trained uh, staff uh, then, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, they just cannot make enough money or cannot put their skills in the operation. So therefore then uh, from this training of uh, technology and skills, uh, we just find, I just find that they also need a managerial uh, knowledge. So it's not only this technology, but often this uh, management and project, uh, uh, project operation is more important than the, uh, this uh, technique, techniques. So this is uh, the lesson on the lessons for Africa uh, infrastructure projects. The Tanzania Zambia Railway, they they actually used the, the, it was a total uh, completely aid project offered by China without uh, too much, uh, without uh, indeed without commercial interest. It was purely political uh, support. But while the World Bank and the West, they uh, emphasized the structural adjustment and uh, putting uh, yeah, stress on the market mechanism. In fact, in Africa during last 30, 40 years, both approaches, they failed. 
So this is uh, just a question to refer to reflect on Africa's uh, development because uh, infrastructure is not just a commodity, but they are also a, a framework, like a prerequisite for a functioning market. That's why you cannot simply do it in a political uh, way as an aid, but you can neither just do it in a market as a com market uh, uh, commodity. So commercial interests and the public interests need to be coordinated when you are doing uh, providing uh, infrastructure and uh, providing the uh, yeah, training. And so therefore then the Chinese, when they are doing the latest infrastructure project, they improve their practice. For example, they increase the proportion of local staff in management positions. And uh, sometimes this is actually a part of as a uh, as this uh, aid program. So the uh, railway was built according to the market uh, mechanism them, but they added this uh, uh, aid uh, and the training as an element, as a friendship element. And then they also uh, facilitated more communication and the strategic decision making. So it's not only like in this uh, uh, operational level, but all more in this uh, strategic decision making. They want uh, both sides, China and Africa, uh, people have uh, the consensus on how to combine. Uh, politics and uh, the uh, business together. And uh, then we had uh, the efficiency-oriented Chinese management uh, combined uh, with uh, more uh, cultural and uh, social discussion. So Chinese uh, uh, yeah, management, they realize this more and more. And uh, finally, then uh, Chinese uh, then increasingly use uh, scientific and systematic project management and information exchange. So there are now more uh, yeah, big data or this ICT uh, knowledge also involved in this uh, infrastructure uh, training. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, that's uh, all about my brief overview of this uh, topic. And uh, yeah, this is the book uh, Morris mentioned, and uh, I welcome uh, your comments. And I actually, some part of my uh, presentation is taken from that book. So yeah, I would like to yeah, welcome your comments and the critics. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Xiaoyang. Um, this is uh, a great reminder of the importance, um, really, of, of skills uh, development and also the fact that, you know, for both sides of um, the China-Africa relations, this is of equal importance and uh, also of equal benefit. And that I think um, um, what you highlighted also that uh, the relations have come a long way and there are definitely a lot of um, improvements in that direction um, where there's yeah, not only more focus on that aspect of skills development, but now also um, other approaches or new solutions um, that have been developed over the years and that uh, seem to be increasingly uh, working well. So yeah, thank you for, for adding that, that key aspect also to, to this discussion here. Um, now we only have seven minutes uh, for the discussion left. Um, I was asked to really finish um, on time at, uh, uh, at, at 10 to uh, 2 p.m. Uh, for the closing remarks um, of the African Union Development Agency. So, um, so what I would ask now everyone um, online is um, to uh, send their questions um, through the chat, um, or uh, you can also um, raise your hands, I guess, some of you at least. Um, we still have all of the uh, panelists with us. So uh, if you have a specific question to a panelist, um, please address it to the panelist. Um, try to keep the question short and to the point so that we can take at least a few in these, uh, yeah, only few minutes left. So I don't see any hands raised so far? 
if like some of the panelists also want to you know engage with one another as you have all had very different uh, angles and topics um, you're also free to open that discussion if there are questions from one panelist to the other please um, please go ahead Um, Chairperson, I see one question from Dr. Laid Zaglami. And um, I think given that, I think it would actually be a chance for us to go ahead and start closing after that, that main question is answered, if you don't mind. Thank yeah, you. I, I can. Yes, Sini, thank you for that. But I, I can't see that the question is formulated completely. It says, how can Africa protect itself from... From, from China, from, from China, I would think. Okay, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Maybe if, if, if that could be specified, I think that would be helpful. Um, there's another question in the chat uh, from uh, David Ngumbuka. He says, uh, China is also exercising unfair protectionism in some industry due to competition but he puts a question mark. So um, is there like uh, someone who wants to speak on that aspect of, of pro protectionism from the panelists? Xiaoyang, if you don't mind, maybe I can put you on the spot here, given that you are quite aware of uh, industrial cooperation in, in the different industries. And uh, perhaps you have a view sure. on that. Uh, sorry, before I was uh, answering the uh, some online uh, greeting, and uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, it's Wu uh, Yabo, right? Mr. Wu's uh, the job improvement activities of China. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, Moritz. Yeah, so should I answer this online question from Yabo? Or? I actually got an uh, oh, yes. question. Yeah, sorry, I just see that now. Yes, right. Uh, Wuya Bo is asking uh, a question to you. Um, the job improvement activities of Chinese enterprises are mainly driven by the Chinese government or due to physical enterprises' needs. So, yeah, if you could answer that one, that would be appreciated. Sure. Yeah, I uh, would say the uh, primary drive is from the business need itself. Uh, as a, in fact, the, yeah, there's always a myth saying Chinese companies like to bring its uh, own uh, workers. But uh, you do not, uh, people, when people say this, people usually do not know how expensive it is for Chinese company to uh, bring Chinese workers now to Africa. You need to pay maybe uh, triple the wage plus a lot of accommodation, visa, and uh, security costs. So therefore, it's definitely a, a practic uh, practical uh, concern, which uh, makes the Chinese companies, uh, uh, yeah, encourage the Chinese companies uh, to uh, recruit uh, local talents and also train them. And uh, when they hope, uh, in fact, uh, to have this uh, uh, workers, uh, uh, yeah, train uh, uh, yeah, as soon as quickly as possible, so that uh, they can take over the Chinese uh, workers' job and uh, then lower the production costs. And uh, the Chinese government uh, certainly added uh, uh, help this trend. And uh, the Chinese government, however, their uh, support are uh, mainly in the in like a providing scholarship and also provide uh, uh, training programs for officials and uh, this uh, more like a long term and also maybe in some uh, uh, theory, like a general theories because the companies uh, they are training they are mainly in very uh, specific positions and very concrete skills short term while the Chinese government support has a complement, uh, then it's mainly in this long term and the more basic uh, uh, technology. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. And there's a second one addressed to you from uh, uh, Julia Schwerbrock. Um, she's asking about if you can elaborate more what you meant by typical Chinese ways of training. Um, I think you, you did refer to some of the um, management uh, methods and, and also taking account like cultural aspects, but perhaps you can just uh, elaborate a bit further on that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I mentioned this uh, typical Chinese, uh, hi, Yulia, <laughs> uh, typical Chinese way of training when I talked about uh, uh, on-site training. So this is, uh, is namely Chinese. Uh, they often recruited the local African workers. And uh, may, after just uh, two, one or two days, uh, this uh, initial introduction, they then uh, put the workers uh, in front of the machines. And uh, then some uh, Chinese uh, uh, masters or some experienced local workers, they, uh, yeah, all Operate, they operate the machine and then they just uh, demonstrate the, this operation to these uh, newly recruited ones. And then maybe after another two or three days, these uh, new recruits, uh, they uh, already started to operate these uh, machines with the guidance, with this uh, experienced uh, tutors. And then maybe after three or five days, then these uh, uh, workers, they uh, already start to uh, operate the themselves. So this is the, the a very, we can see, efficient and also very pragmatic way of training. Uh, it's an uh, advantage is it's very quick and also cost saving. But the, the problem is uh, actually there is a newly recruited workers. They do not really understand the mechanism. And uh, then they also, they just uh, imitate and uh, uh, so therefore then they can, although they can very quickly take over the operation, but when there is a problem, then they cannot really solve it. So this is, uh, I call it a typical Chinese way of training because uh, it's uh, also caused by this language barriers between Chinese and Africans. When other like investors, if they speak English well, then they can explain and maybe give them a more systematic training to these uh, new local workers. But the Chinese uh, uh, workers, they do often do not uh, speak very well English. Then they can only use these gestures to show the operation. Uh, and uh, then, uh, yeah, it's more like uh, this uh, tacit, people call it tacit and uh, experiential knowledge. So this is uh, what I mean by this uh, Chinese manner. It's related to the China's uh, company, uh, Chinese company's right. uh, style. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank you very much for adding this clarification. I think that was very helpful. Um, colleagues, we've reached the time limit, uh, so I think I'd, I'd have to stop it here. There are now a few more questions coming in on the chat, um, but a bit too late. Um, so I hope maybe the organizers can follow up on those questions. There's one quite interesting one on, on regional collaboration. So not only at the African Union level or at the national level, but also looking at the, at the RECs, the regional economic uh, communities. Um, but uh, I'll stop it here um, and I'll uh, hand back over um, to the organizers and, and uh, co-organizers and invite uh, the uh, representative of the African Union Development Agency uh, to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much uh, to the audience uh, with all protocol observed. Before we end over to Mr. Martin Boalia, who is the director uh, among us, we would like to thank you for being with us so patient. The intention is to see how we can have uh, a second webinar to involve the civil society, uh, most of the civil society organization, because they are so uh, uh, vibrant and then uh, very, uh, we have a position where they are against China, but today it was to bring facts to show how we can leverage on the advance we observe in China and to learn from that on the continent. 
So uh, we saw what is happening with regard to the demographic dividend. We have to build on that because our wealth is not only minerals. Our wealth, we have also our population. So we need to build on that accordingly, and it requires training. If we have to train the youth, we have to train those who should work, there is a possibility really to change what is happening on our continent because we have evidences and facts that has, that has been happening elsewhere. The reason why we are having this meeting involving the think tank and also the AUD and NEPAD policy brief tank is to make sure that when we provide information, when we take decision, everything should be based on evidences and data. We need to move away from emotions. That the reason why we understand that people are talking outside there. We need to help the public opinion that we need to move away from emotion and to use evidences. And also beyond that, we need to make sure that we have capability within our countries to negotiate accordingly through bilateral cooperation with China. So based on those information and those evidences, we need to improve labor and how to treat our people on the ground. I don't think a Chinese company in South Africa, the way people who are working are treated is the same that it could happen in another country if they didn't like we share properly with some of those companies coming on the continent. And we should also recognize the capability of China in terms of infrastructure, road, as we already say so. And now they are even making commercial aircraft. So with those information, we would like really to thank all of you for being taken away from emotion and bringing evidence and facts to have a very constructive, useful, respectful meeting. With those few words, I need to find out if Mr. Bakke Boyle is there, our director, to close this meeting. Mr. Boria? Since Mr. Martin Boyle is having another meeting in Stellenbosch, as we speak now, so we are taking this opportunity to honor all of you sitting here, all protocol observe, to thank you and to declare that this meeting is closed. And we are looking forward to seeing you very soon. We share the program and the concept note for our next webinar with ECOSOC to focus on the same topic, China and Africa. Thank you so very much.